connecting to fiber channel storage. So we've, we've talked about the first of the, the big four, and network, and processor, and memory, and, uh, and storage. And, and in the last nugget, we discussed how you should set up your network so you can configure your virtual switches, so you can get data in and out of your server. And over the next couple of nuggets, we're actually going to move away from networking and into the, the second of the big four. That is storage. And we're going to spend a lot of time on storage, because storage is really important. It's where the, it's where the VMDK files are, are housed, and it's, it's, it's how you you actually enable the, the vMotioning of systems whenever you're connecting to different storage types. Obviously, connecting your, your virtual servers into direct attached storage is one thing, but being able to connect those servers into, into other types of storage or shared storage is where you can really gain a lot of additional uh, abilities. And, then, and it's really that which you're going to want to do if you move into the standard or the enterprise version of ESX. We're going to talk about fiber channel storage specifically in this nugget, and we're going to talk a, not only at a high level about what is fiber channel storage, but how you can configure figure it on your existing server. Now, we're going to talk about fiber channel and com in comparison with iSCSI storage and also some concepts surrounding fiber channel. And, and then we're going to actually show how uh, an ESX server can be connected into a fiber channel storage array and then talk about a little bit of the configurations and the gotchas associated with fiber channel storage. So like we did before, let's actually start by talking about a little picture associated with our VMware uh, setup. And let's go ahead and open up uh, uh, another uh, blank page here that we can connect into and let's draw our ESX server here here's our ESX server and and then here's our big old fiber channel storage array here and uh, this fiber channel storage array it can be uh, an EMC storage array it could be an Hitachi it can be uh, uh, all the different kinds of storage arrays out there but this is specifically one that is a fiber channel now typically these fiber channel storage arrays and at least historically they used to be fairly expensive and, and in fact in some cases they were very expensive and and so in a lot of times there were uh, people in the smaller smaller environments that couldn't really afford connections to fiber channel arrays because of the expense associated with them. Well, the price of these fiber channel arrays has actually come down to the point now where they're roughly equivalent with the, uh, uh, the cost of an iSCSI storage array. To connect your ESX server into a fiber channel array, you need a connection point, which is called an HBA. And we've talked about HBA before, but an HBA is a, is a card that sits in the back of your ESX server that is a host bus adapter and converts iSCSI commands into fiber commands and back. So it's kind of like a modem for, for, for iSCSI connections. That I, that Fiber channel HBA connects into the fiber channel SAN into what's called a, a volume on that fiber channel SAN. And so what you need to do or what your storage administrator needs to do is actually carve out a volume on that fiber channel SAN for your ESX servers to connect to. The process of carving out that, that array or that, uh, that volume on the fiber channel SAN actually also does a process of what's called zoning or masking. And the concept of zoning or masking is for the storage Processor, that's processor that sits here on the edge of this fiber channel SAN, the, the brocade switch or whatever sort of switch you're using to uh, attach your fiber channel SAN into the rest of your infrastructure, your storage administrator needs to carve out a piece of data, needs to carve out a space, and then also needs to provide it a path in order to get to your ESX server. Now, there are a number of different ways that you can carve these out, and there are good ways and there are bad ways, but essentially you need to be able to create a storage array that is large enough so that you can host a number of systems that you want to be able to vMotion together. So if, when you're thinking about carving out fiber channel and, and you're thinking about best practices associated with carving out how big you want that array to be, for all of these systems that you want to essentially to be managed together inside of an ESX infrastructure or a virtual infrastructure, you want those all to be managed together inside of the same volume because they're going to be moved back and forth between uh, uh, ESX servers based on the, the attachment to that volume. Now, what is interesting and exciting about fiber channel SANs and SANs in general is when you have multiple servers that are connecting into that same location. So let's say we have our two servers here and both of them are, are masked out. The, uh, the, the, the fiber is masked out so that uh, each server, each ESX chassis, has a LUN or a logical unit number to connect into that fiber channel array. By doing that now, we actually have the ability for this, for this uh, volume to be seen by both ESX servers. Now, if you, if you think about it in the Microsoft world, 
if we tried to have two Microsoft servers that were both connecting into the same uh, location on a SAN, that'd be a Microsoft cluster. Or if you didn't have a cluster, you, you, you'd be modifying a, a data over here, and then the other server might be modifying data, and no server would really know what's going on in, inside of that volume because they, they really don't talk to each other. Well, there actually is a special kind of file system that is used by VM called VMFS. And the, the version of uh, the VMFS file system that's currently using is, using is VMFS version 3. VMS, VMFS version 3 is a special kind of file system that is designed specifically for small numbers of very, very large files. So the block sizes are very, very large. And it also has its own built-in locking capabilities so that the individual files, once they are used by a particular ESX host, they actually are locked for use and they can't be modified by other ESX hosts. And that's what allows these hosts to be able to be LUND out to the same volume and masked out to the same volume and yet still not interrupt each other's processing on that volume. And in fact, it's a, it's a key component of the vMotion process and of the ability for multiple ESX servers to touch the data all at the same location. Now, obviously, any time that we're masking out or lulling out uh, uh, this uh, volume to our ESX servers, there has to be some way of addressing these each individual zone, each individual uh, item that is in that path going from the, the, the hard drive all the way to the server. And the, the way that we do this in the SAN world is through what's called a worldwide port name, a WWPN. Every device that connects in and out of the, 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 the that connects into the fiber channel SAN, whether it's a, a switch, a fiber channel switch, or the SAN itself, or the, the systems that are connecting in, every point along the way has its own worldwide port name. And those worldwide port names are long series of hexadecimal numbers that are used as the addressing so that information can get from source to destination location. It is also the location or the, the mechanism by which the zoning and the masking works. And so you can zone a particular worldwide port, na port name on the target so that the data can make its way through the pathing across the fiber channel switches and back to the server, to the port on the server that it needs to accomplish. In most cases, most of our ESX servers don't have a single connection, but actually have two connections into our fiber channel array. And it's through you, the use of that worldwide port name on both of these uh, connections into this ESX server that we are, allow ourselves to have this high availability. Now, when we're, when we're masking out this information, we actually have software inside of ESX that handles the connections to our fiber channel array. If you don't have this uh, masking software, you'll actually see two copies of the fiber channel array, and you don't want to do that. But ESX concatenates those two together, so you're not going to see two copies of the data on that fiber channel array. Additionally, also on the ESX, ESX server is software that allows you to be able to perform what is called multipathing. And it's this multipathing that actually and concatenates the two of these uh, connections between the ESX server and the fiber channel SAN. And so what you end up actually with when you're looking at these ESX servers that are connected into these fiber channel SANs is you're looking at a series of worldwide port names, and those worldwide port names have access to a series of SCSI targets on that fiber channel SAN. Let's actually take a look at an example of a, a, a full ESX infrastructure that currently is connected into a fiber channel SAN. Now, I, I, I want to stop for just a second because fiber channel SANs are, are, are very expensive, and being able to purchase one for purposes just of demonstrating this to you is it would be overtly expensive. And so I've worked with an organization called 3T Systems at www.3tsystems.com who have graciously provided access to their fiber channel SAN and their ESX infrastructure for the purposes of demonstrating this to you. So I, I want to say thank you, first of all, to the people at 3T Systems for, for giving us the ability to take a look at their internal network and all of the connections into their fiber channel SAN so that we can see what they look like. You'll see here, if we go to the configuration tab on this particular virtual machine and click on storage adapters, you'll see that we have a two gigabyte or two gigabit fiber channel host adapter. Here's our HBA. And it's listed as VMHBA1. You'll see down below here is VMHBA0. This Smart Array 6i is the local onboard RAID controller for this particular HP system. We're going to talk about the iSCSI software adapter a little bit later. But here we can see that we have a connection. We have a, 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 a fiber channel HBA card that is currently plugged into this system. And it has a number of targets that is currently seeing 
on the storage area network. You'll see here that those targets actually have a pretty large capacity. The other benefit of storage area networks is that you can create very, very large size arrays or large size volumes. We have two volumes here, one of 1.6 terabyte and one of 1.3 terabytes. You can see that because we have multiple HBA cards here, we have two different paths to get to our target. The both targets show that the same amount of capacity available so that we know that this, they're the same target. We also have the worldwide port name here, and this is the unique identifier for that HBA so that the, so that the SAN can talk to the HBA on the server and transfer data back and forth. Now, the very first thing you're probably going to say is, well, there, there's not a lot of configuration here. There, there, there really isn't. Most of the configuration for SANS actually happens at the SAN itself. And, and, and configuring SANS is out of scope of this, uh, of this particular nugget, and in fact, this entire series, because each SAN technology, whether it be you know Hitachi or EMC or whatever, each SAN technology is going to have its own process for doing the lending and for doing the masking and doing the zoning. And so once you've done the configuration at the SAN side to be able to enable the SAN to talk to the ESX server, the only thing you need to do on the ESX server is hit this rescan button. And immediately, the HBA is going to rescan all of the LUNs that are available to it, that, are, that are, it is connected to, and look for SCSI targets that are open to it. And it will be immediately then be able to use and create a data store on those uh, available volumes. Once we've rescanned the volume and, and, and made those available to us, we can go up here into our storage node here and take a look at all of the different storage that is now available to us. You'll see here the, uh, the three different uh, data storage availability or places that are available to us at this point. The first of which is local storage. It's about 128 gig, uh, 94 of which is free. And then we have these two sand, sand storage that are available to us. There's that 1.64 terabyte uh, of which uh, 1.49 of that terabyte is currently used. And so you can see that once that is available to us, we can go ahead and add storage to it and add a data store to this to actually create a VMFS partition. I'm going to go ahead and click over on the other server here and uh, we're going to take a look at another uh, available storage so I can show you the Add Storage button. Right now, when I click the Add Storage button, it gives me the option of choosing a disk slash LUN storage or a network file system storage. When we choose disk slash LUN, that allows us to create new, a new data store either on a fiber channel or an iSCSI or a local SCSI disk. If we choose NFS, that's if we have an NFS share that we have on a Unix server somewhere that we want to connect to. We're going to talk about NFS a little bit later on when we go into a different nugget. But I want to show you, if we click on disk LUN, we're not going to see anything here right now now because we don't have any available disk LUNs. When we go and talk about iSCSI connections, we're going to go through this entire process of adding new data stores so that we can add a data store for the purposes of storing a virtual machine onto our ESX host. But this is the location where we would actually create a new data store and get uh, uh, the, 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 the data store prepared for the purposes of putting virtual machines on that data store. We can choose properties of a particular data store and see information about not only the volume, but also the extents that are, that are attached into that volume. The data store name here is VM Storage 206, and we have a single extent that's currently connected into that volume. If we want, we, we can add multiple hard disk partitions or multiple multiple little volumes to create one single logical volume for if we need to expand the, the amount of data storage that we have. And we can do this by clicking the Add Extent button here. And again, just like before, we don't have any available extents uh, uh, that we can add to it, so we're not going to see any here. But this is the process by which we would expand the size of our data store if we were starting to run out of space. We also have the ability here to manage the paths. Now we talked about back here in our, in our little diagram that we put together that there are multiple paths between our ESX server and our fiber channel storage array. And we can manage how we connect our, our local server to the remote paths here inside of this Manage Paths location. This actually happens to be a local store, but with, in a SAN connection, we would be able to change whether or not our policy is set to fixed or the most recently used. Now the difference between these two types of paths Path selection uh, policies determines whether or not we want to choose a preferred path and then only fail over when we have a problem, or if we always want to maintain on that failure after the failure occurs. So, do we want to fail over and fail back consistently, or do we want to keep using the most recently used path after a failure occurs? And so, depending on how you want to use the paths that you have between your server and your data store, you're going to choose whether or not you want to bounce back and forth or just continue to use the last used path. 
We can say here to change also, where we can change whether or not we want to enable or disable this, uh, this particular path for load balancing or failover, or if we want to just stop routing traffic over that path. Perhaps you may want to disable all the, the, the drives, the hard drives that are, that are connected into that path, and you don't want to use that path for some reason or another. Maybe you're making a, a, a change to it, or maybe you're, you're getting rid of that path entirely, so we can disable the traffic pattern over, patterns over that path. All of this are available inside of the properties of this particular data store. Once we've created the connection into this into this SAN, we can then create the data store. And so first of all, we have to, number one, create the volume, number two, create the data store, and then number three, add the virtual machines into the data store for us to be able to begin working with our virtual machines. Let's go ahead and bring that picture back up again so we can talk a little bit about some of the gotchas associated with creating these, uh, creating these volumes in our fiber channel array. Obviously, we have a lot of different options for how we can create these volumes because the fiber channel SANs are long large, very large. And we also have options for how we can configure the zoning that connects our ESX servers into our fiber channel SANs. Generally, it is a good idea, or in fact, it's necessary for all of the ESX server hosts that use some sort of shared storage. If you want these, these hosts to be able to, to use the same shared storage, they must be in a single zone. If you have a, if you have a large environment, for example, that you want to have some sort of uh, separation of, of data between uh, different types of data, Perhaps you have some very, very high priority data like HR data that you want to separate from low, low priority or low risk data. Then you can create multiple zones for those different areas, those different types of, of risk areas. But be aware that in order to do that, your ESX servers need to be able to connect into those zones. And, and, and typically, it is not a good idea to create lots and lots of very, very small volumes. It's, it's generally a good idea to create very, very large volumes and then, and then connect the ESX server into those very large volumes. And the, it, it, although that kind of goes counter to the way it would work if you're, if you're connecting a, a, a host into a, a fiber channel SAN because you typically want smaller volumes whenever you're connecting hosts in because of backup and restore purposes. Because of the way backup and restore works with, with VMware, that's really not as much of a consideration because there's a smaller number of files that you're actually backing up and restoring. Now also, there's, there are some, some choices that you may choose depending on whether or not you want larger or smaller volumes. By, by creating larger volumes, you have, a, you have more flexibility for adding and subtracting VMs into that environment. You, you, you have more ability to vMotion back and forth between those environments and back and forth between those ESX hosts. And, and really, you, you, you just have less that you have to manage. But that being said, creating very, very large volumes has the potential for, for, for SCSI locking issues, for spindle contention issues, and, and, and you may have different needs for different RAID characteristics. All of these fiber channel SANs have capabilities for doing lots of different types of raids, raid ones, raid zeros, raid five, raid ten, raid, all the way up to the, the proprietary levels of raid that are they're in some of the very, very high end SANs. So be aware that uh, you, if you have different raid characteristics, you may have to create larger or smaller um, or, or additional volumes based on those raid characteristics. Lastly, there's one special kind of uh, uh, volume that you may want to create in certain circumstances where you may not necessarily want to just host VMDK files on your array. So back here, again, looking at these little dots here, these little dots are here to re represent a VMDK file that's sitting on my volume here. But, but what, if I have a, what if I have a terabyte size database that I want to, uh, to run on a SQL server that's running inside of my ESX host? Maybe I've got a little uh, SQL server somewhere that's uh, running on this, this ESX host and and the, the process of encapsulating that terabyte uh, that terabyte database into a VMDK file would probably be a bad idea you probably wouldn't necessarily want to encapsulate that all into a single VMDK file because then you have the overhead involved with managing that VMDK file in those cases there is another type of, uh, of special connection called a raw device mapping or an RDM and what an RDM is is it's a mapping file inside of VMFS that kind of proxies the connection between the VMFS partition and this raw data partition right here. It is used, again, when you don't want to encapsulate data into a VMDK file. What this RDM does is it gives your guest your guest, essentially the virtual machine, access directly into a raw device. You typically do these if you're doing Microsoft cluster servers or you have very large databases or things like that. But these, again, are called raw data mappings. And raw data mappings, are, although are rare, are used anytime you have these very, very large environments that you want to connect to. 
uh, or excuse me, uh, raw device mapping. So, so let's take a look at what if we wanted to create one of these raw device mappings. Now, now obviously, since we're borrowing this system from uh, 3tsystems.com, uh, we're not going to be able to actually show you what one of these systems look like. But let's take a look at how we would actually configure one of these systems. So we, if you needed to create one, you could. Once you've created the virtual machine, and once you've also on the storage side, once you've created the uh, the volume that you want to uh, map into a raw, an RDM, you go into edit settings of the existing virtual machine machine with the machine powered off and you add in a new hard disk. So you click on add and hard disk and click next and you'll see this raw device mappings actually light up. Once it lights up you'll, you'll be given the option to choose where the location is you want to go for the raw device mapping, what the SCSI target is, what you want to configure for that RDM and, and how you want to set up the configuration. Once that's done and once you power on the machine again the machine will have access, direct access into that, that raw location on your, on your data store. So this is the process by which to create RDMs. RDMs. So what have we talked about today in this nugget? We've talked about uh, we talked about uh, connecting into uh, SCSI uh, fiber channel uh, data stores. We talked about creating data scores in fiber channel. We talked a little bit about the differences between fiber channel and also iSCSI, but I think we're going to get a lot more into uh, the concept of iSCSI storage in, uh, in our next nugget. We talked about some concepts associated with fiber channel and actually how to connect into a fiber channel storage. You, you have to have that HBA and you have to have the, uh, the masking set up properly on the storage side for so you can hit that rescan button and uh, start the process. And we also talked a little bit about some configurations and gotchas and touched for just a minute on RDMs. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.